Good evening. And welcome um, to our large and growing group of folks who are attending this program. Um, it's good to see, with, see you and be with you um, this evening. My name is Sophia Wollman and I am representing our uh, organizing group at this program, Remembrance and Hope, the journey from Hiroshima to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Thank you for joining us in this virtual space. This program has been a labor of love by a number of community members who are active and engaged in and committed to the work of Mass Peace Action's Nuclear Disarmament Working Group, specifically the subcommittee focused on building the power of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons or the TPNW or the Ban Treaty. It has been wonderful to work with this, these people and um, also our technical support by the Mass Peace Action staff. We really appreciate this effort. Just for housekeeping, we'll be keeping people on mute to ensure good sound quality, um, but there will be time for discussion and breakout groups. Please do make good use of the chat. Um, we will especially encourage people to use the chat to share action items towards the end of the program. Our work as a subcommittee is at once focused on US-based and US-centered actions to move our own society and government towards disarmament. Um, and we're also focused on working in solidarity with our international partners who are uh, at work in their own context. Our newly formed subcommittee has coalesced entirely in virtual space over the last eight months. And we decided that this year's annual commemoration of Hiroshima and Nagasaki Day is a good time to host our first program on the TPNW. With this first in a series of three introductory programs on the TPNW, the next will be taking place in the fall. We are putting this groundbreaking treaty into context, particularly as most of us in this Zoom room live and pay taxes and are part of civil society in the United States. Let me screen share quickly. The United States, our country okay, has about 1,500 nuclear missiles that are ready to fly. Um, you'll see them, they're the blue, they're represented by the blue on the outside of that circle. Many of these weapons are significantly more destructive than those used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we are close second only to Russia's nuclear arsenal. The United States conceptualizes and brands itself as a leader in the global community. Like many other problems of our day, nuclear weapons call us to be critical of such discourse of leadership. The United States is leading the world in many ways down an extremely dangerous and destructive path as our country has normalized and perpetuated a global system that is fundamentally premised on the capacity to inflict unimaginable harm and violence. At times, explaining this as maintaining a balance of power. It is through this premise that the United States imposes so-called order, but this is a contradiction of massive investments in harmful practices in the name of peace, stability, order. It is double speak that is pervasive in the major industries and systems and structures that violently determine how resources are allocated and exploited, how power is asserted and maintained, and how inequality is perpetuated. The dominant framing of the A-bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is most generously one of a necessary evil that inevitably spirals to one of evasion of any responsibility or accountability. Such harmful approaches and exceptional, exceptionalism are part of how the United States maintains its power. These are not qualities of acceptable leadership. The stories of Hiroshima and Nagasaki challenge us to look deeply at the country we call home and at the government that acts in our name. 
The TPNW, meanwhile, is an international response by every level of government and civil society around the world that flat out reject any legitimacy given to these weapons of mass destruction. The Ban Treaty is an assertion of a different kind of leadership that does not hedge responsibility for disarmament or use nuclear weapons to impose political and economic interests. Indeed, the Ban Treaty is an extension of the anti-nuclear movement that emerged from Japan following dozens of United States nuclear tests in the Pacific Ocean that contaminated tons and tons of fish in the 1960s. The Ban Treaty, is a rejection of both nuclear weapons technology, as well as a framework of domination that causes harm across the board. Uh, we turn to our agenda for the evening. We have heard this beautiful music chosen by a member of our group, Polly Allen, um, as we come into this space. And we'll turn shortly to a, a poem and dance piece by Don Kramer, who I see um, is a participant this evening. We'll then hear from Jerry Ross um, in remembering Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We will participate in singing Hirosh and reciting Hiro the Hiroshima song that is shared around the world. And then we'll have time for our first section of discussion that will focus on reflection. When we return, I'll say a few more words on the treaty for the on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and then turn to Asha Ashokan, who will delve more deeply into some background of the work that the treaty is doing. And then we'll return to those same breakout groups um, to focus more on action. Both of those groups will be 15 minutes long. And then we will come back. I'll say just a couple more words and um, Sarah will uh, introduce us, perhaps likely reintroduce us to the song Imagine, which I have not, I have neglected to attribute to John Lennon, but of course that is who wrote and performs this song. So I again uh, welcome you, I welcome you to utilize the chat um, and let's turn now to Don Kramer's piece 1945.
thank you, Don, um, for creating that piece and Cole for sharing it. Um, I will uh, put that in the chat, the website where that appears, and uh, we'll also include it on the actions handout um, so folks can review and watch again and share. Um, I'm now happy to introduce uh, Jerry Ross of Massachusetts Peace Action, who will um, guide us through remembering Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Good evening. And thank you, Sophia, for sharing that. It was very powerful. So let us begin with a few facts. Scientific research in the early years of the 20th century led to a much deeper understanding of nature and the vastly more powerful forces inside atoms, nuclear forces, than the chemical processes we had understood before then. In 1938, two German scientists raised the possibility a bomb of almost unimaginable power, an atomic bomb, could be created by splitting the atom. When World War II broke out, scientists in the United States and Great Britain were worried that Germany might figure out how to build such a bomb and urged their governments to try to build a bomb before Nazi Germany could do so. Fortunately, the war with Germany ended before such a bomb could be built, but the Allies' effort to build the bomb, called the Manhattan Project, continued and was successful, and the United States decided to use the bomb in its war with Japan. On August 6th, the first atomic bomb was dropped on the city of Hiroshima. The film you're about to uh, see was withheld from the American public for 22 years. This is what happened. Cole, run the film, please. At 17 seconds after 8.15, on the clear bright morning of August 6, 1945, an atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. The pilots of the United States Air Force's 509th Composite Group could see flowers in the gardens below. The bomb weighed 9,000 pounds and was as powerful as 12,500 tons of TNT. The bomb exploded within 100 feet of the target. The fireball was 18,000 feet across. The temperature at the center of the fireball was as hot as the surface of the sun. Near the center, people became nothing. Near the center, there was no sound. The light from the bomb flashed whiter than any white, like a sheet of traveling sun. Eyes turned up to the bomb melted. Within nine seconds, 100,000 people were killed or doomed, and 100,000 more injured. Within nine seconds, the city caught fire. Asphalt and steel burned like paper. Then the day grew black with smoke and dust. Over the city rose a cloud of smoke 40,000 feet high. Two hours later, drops of black rain, the size of marbles, began to fall. Remember, I remember, a big light comes, very strong light. I never see so strong. I do not know what is happening. My friend, she and I are always together, but I could not find her. So dark it gets, so red like a fire. All is smoking dark red. I cannot see anyone. 
Many people run. I just follow. Pretty soon like fog. Red fog. Then gray. And people down all around me. Many people look so awful. Skin come off. Just awful. Makes me so scared, so afraid. I never knew such hurt on people. Not human. I think if I'm in hell, it is like this. No faces, no eyes, red and burnt all things, like women's hair, dusty and smoking with burning. Many people go into the river. I watch them. Many people are drinking water, but they fall in and die, and they float away. Voices cry, calling names. I cannot hear because so many voices cry or calling names. So many voices. The light from the bomb created permanent shadows, burned into wood and etched onto stone. Leaves, flowers, and men disappeared but their shadows remained. In Hiroshima on that day there was no panic, only ghastly stillness, the quiet of death. People moved slowly along the roads, like ghosts in dust and ash, and fell dead as they walked. So let's all take a deep breath. Now I'm going to ask you to consider three questions. First of all, why is it so hard to talk about Hiroshima and about nuclear weapons here in America. Second, was it right or even legal to drop the atomic bomb? Third, what have we learned about nuclear weapons since the time we dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Let's start with why it's so hard to talk about this. Well, if you are like me, you probably grew up believing the atom bomb ended World War II. But what if that were not true? Surely most, uh, but not all, people at the time believed that. Actually, a group of 50 Manhattan Project scientists wrote a letter to President Truman urging the bomb not be used against human beings. The letter never reached Truman. Top US military leaders, including Generals Eisenhower and MacArthur, all later said dropping the bomb was entirely unnecessary. Historians today know that Japan was militarily defeated long before the atom bomb was dropped and that it was the Soviet Union's entry into the war on the morning of August 8th that precipitated Japan's final decision to surrender. President Truman perhaps believed that Hiroshima was, was solely a military base. He noted in his diary that the bomb would be used only on military targets. But once the reports on Hiroshima came in, Truman realized the incredible power of the bomb and the human toll it exacted. And after Nagasaki, Truman specifically halted the use of the bomb without his express approval, saying it shouldn't be used, quote, to kill a bunch of kids, unquote. Those were his words. The narrative that the atomic bomb ended the war and saved American lives was promulgated almost immediately thereafter. And news of the human carnage it actually caused was withheld from the world for many months. Nearly a, le a year later, John Hersey managed to get into Japan to write an article for the New Yorker entitled Hiroshima. It turned into a book and the American public 
were outraged and appalled. In response, Secretary of War Stimson wrote an article for Harper's Magazine in February of 1947 titled, Why We Chose to Use the Atom Bomb. It was self-serving, distorted, and used false statistics, but it succeeded in establishing justification for the bomb within the American public. Meanwhile, during America's occupation of Japan, it was illegal for anyone uh, even to write about the bomb. The film you saw parts of just a short time ago uh, were withheld from the American public for 22 years. At the same time, the world had descended into the polarized period of the Cold War where atomic weapons were promoted as necessary for deterrence. The self-righteous narrative about the bomb became deeply embedded in the American psyche. Second question, was it right or legal to drop the bomb? This question seems to have been brushed aside by the argument of necessity that we just visited, concluding somehow the moral implications of the mass murder of a quarter of a million human beings, civilians, can be overlooked. In fact, the myth of nuclear deterrence, long accepted as the basis for US nuclear policy, presumes the, real, uh, the morality of threatening to kill millions of people as a way of preventing their doing the same to us. Yet moral leaders from Bertrand Russell in 1955 to Pope Francis in 2017 have all stated unequivocally that nuclear weapons are immoral. In terms of legality, their use or threat of use is prohibited under several international conventions. And now the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, first approved by 122 countries in 2017, outlaws these weapons permanently for the countries that sign and ratify it. We'll revisit this in depth later in the program. Despite the moral and legal arguments against nuclear weapons, their necessity and even desirability maintains a strong hold within American public opinion. While polls in, uh, 19, uh, in 2009 supported uh, President Obama's declaration that the US would not use nuclear weapons against a country that did not have them, Opinions shift dramatically in favor of their use if America is attacked or as a means to save the lives of American soldiers. I would maintain one of the reasons for this is that the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were promoted as a good thing that ended the war and saved American lives. Finally, what have we learned since Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Well, one thing we have learned is that international agreements can be used to manage global conflict and at least for 76 years now have prevented a recurrence of atomic warfare. These efforts began in 1946 with the very first solution of the newly formed United Nations, which was quote, to find a solution to the problem of the atomic bomb. Since then, international agreements limited the number of nations that developed these weapons, and for those that did, the numbers and kinds of weapons they could possess. We learned we could stop the testing of these weapons, restrict them from certain areas of the world and outer space, and reduce other kinds of risks. We even learned that former adversaries could work to reduce their nuclear stockpiles, and four nations could give them up entirely. But while international efforts have prevented an actual nuclear war, the weapons have been used to threaten and coerce others by those who have them, especially the United States. And there have been terrifying instances when they came close to being activated by accident or miscalculation. So clearly arms control is not enough. What Hiroshima and Nagasaki really showed us is these devices are weapons like no other. The horrific humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons make their use 
unacceptable under any circumstance. That was the great achievement in international thinking that paved the way for the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. But it's a lesson only partially grasped, mostly by people outside the United States. In the coming sections, we will learn more about the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and the TPNW. For now, let us end with Albert Einstein's words from 1946, quote, the unleashed power of the atom has changed everything save our modes of thinking, unquote. It's time we change our thinking. Sophia? Thank you so much, Jerry. Um, that has given us a lot to feel and think about indeed. Um, it was important to our organizers, our organizing team that this program engages our minds as well as our hearts. And so um, I welcome Susan Mursky, who is also a co-convener of um, MAPA's Nuclear Disarmament Working Group. Um, to lead us into the next portion. Never again shall we allow another atom bomb to fall. This is the title of a song that most Japanese people know. So I want to sing it to you. I'll sing it to you in Japanese. And then I'd like us all to say the English together. So wherever you are, whoever you're with, let's all say the English together. And then perhaps I'll sing the Japanese again. Furu asto no machi akare ni yori no hona umesi yaketsu chini ima wasiro ihana Saku a yurusu majigen bakuo, me tabi rusu majigen bakuo, uara no ma chini. And together, in the place where our old home village was destroyed, we buried the charred bones. Now the white flowers are blooming there. Ah, we must never allow, we must absolutely forbid another atom bomb to come. No much Thank you. Thank you so much for leading us so beautifully, Susan. And you will notice that um, many of you have been invited to unmute. Um, this is in preparation for our first breakout, which Diane will introduce. Um, and so if you could just either just stay quite quiet um, until we go into breakout groups, that would be great. Diane? Hi, everybody. Um, oops. Okay. Um, so in this 15 minute breakout, the first breakout, we're going to use prompts from Joanna Macy's work that reconnects. And now some of you are familiar with it, some not. Um, Joanna has a PhD in religious studies and is a scholar in, of Buddhism, systems theory, and deep ecology. Work that reconnects was developed in the late 70s when concerns around nuclear weapons and nuclear power were growing. Instead of reinventing the wheel, I'm just gonna quote her definition of this work. 
The work that reconnects helps people discover and experience their innate connections with each other and the self-healing powers of the web of life, transforming despair and overwhelm into inspired collaborative action. We're doing a super, super abbreviated practice tonight. Um, if you'd like to know more, there'll be a link uh, to her site. So each person will have about two minutes. Facilitators are going to time. So you'll give brief responses to three of the four steps in the work. Uh, we're not rigid at all. So if you feel led to reflect differently, please feel free. Um, and facilitators will facilitate however they want. Um, this is a very simple description of the steps, which is appropriate since the time's brief. So we're gonna begin with gratitude and gratitude grounds us uh, in what is already present in our lives. It helps us be more fully present and open space for the next step. What are you grateful for? It can be anything from being here tonight to feeling the breeze as we walk. The second is honoring our pain for the world. What pain in the world am I honoring today? This can be something from your personal life that's causing you pain or the larger world issues such as nuclear, the threat of nuclear war. Honoring pain is meant to experiencing it, experience it face it, and then allowing yourself to release it so that it can't consume you. Obviously, we're not going to do all of that. So I invite you all just to name what pain you're honoring today. The third is seeing with new eyes. What is something that you heard or thought or felt tonight? Um, did you see anything differently? Did you come to understand anything in a new way? And the fourth step will be the focus of the second breakout, which is going forth, taking action. And we plan on the same people being in both groups. So thank you. And I hope you all get something out of it. Thank you. Um, thank you to the folks who are in the breakout group that um, I was in. I hope that others found that um, a connective time, a reconnecting time. Um, I know we had folks from across uh, this continent. And so it's just, a, it's just powerful to be together. Um, we turn now to the TPNW portion of this focused program. And the ban treaty serves as an outright rejection of these weapons of mass destruction, asserting at the UN level their immorality and illegality, much like the bans on biological and chemical weapons. The TPNW was adopted at the UN in 2017 following three major high-level conferences on the humanitarian consequences and impacts of nuclear weapons. These were held um, in Oslo, Norway, in Nayarit, Mexico, and in Vienna, Austria. I remember when I was 24 years old and just becoming involved in the anti-nuclear movement, learning about nuclear weapons at the annual World Conference Against Atomic and Hydrogen Bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And as a young person recently out of college, I was so struck to hear Austrian ambassador Alexander Kment speaking about the need to change the discourse. I had never heard politicians or government people talking about discourse. I'd heard that in political theory classes, but he was talking about the need to change the discourse around nuclear weapons. We must not accept any framing of weapons of mass destruction of, as strategically important or legitimate. Instead, the discourse must not be about strategic strategy, but about humanitarian consequences of their impact and their use. It is simply too dangerous, practically and ethically, 
to justify such horrific technologies through legitimizing a discourse around their strategic value. The conclusion of these three high-level conferences was the ban, the ban treaty. Now, the US government did not participate in meaningful ways in those conferences, and it has not adopted the CPNW. However, the ban and the elimination of nuclear weapons has the power to fundamentally change the ways that the US and indeed the other nuclear weapon states conduct themselves and impose their political and economic interests around the world. The ways that they do this presently are extremely harmful to billions of people, to our planet, and to uh, human beings' hopes and dreams and love and dignity. This is part of what is so powerful about the TPNW. It fundamentally challenges the basis of global leadership, as I mentioned. Now, for decades, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty has been central to um, arms control. It has three pillars you may be familiar. Um, it affirms the na nation's right to non-military uh, nuclear power. It prevents non-nuclear weapon states from acquiring nuclear weapons, and it affirms the nuclear weapon states obligations to disarm their arsenals. The MPT has been important in preventing widespread proliferation of nuclear weapons, but it has not been able to transcend global power structures nor exert sufficient pressure towards disarmament by the nuclear weapon states. In recent years, the NPT has also been strongly undermined by US and Israeli refusal to establish a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. And I feel strongly that I can't help but point out this fundamental danger of the pillar that enshrines non-military nuclear energy as an inalienable right. Given the essential danger of this technology, the challenges it poses to enforcement, and the dangerous insistence on shoring up power to drive unsustainable and harmful economic systems of extraction. The ban treaty therefore asserts leadership by governments and people who do not want these weapons, who do not want power that is imposed by weapons of mass destruction. It is therefore to a rejection of domination as a legitimate form of leadership and of the discriminatory system in which certain countries are allowed to have weapons of mass destruction that others are not. The ban treaty asserts leadership with the starting point of concern for well being rather than the, at the expense of this ethical commitment. And it holds the power and the potential to truly challenge systems of oppressive and violent power at work in the world. I see the ban treaty as an opportunity for global solidarity and collaboration, as well as an assertion of the will and intention and movements to change the system and to change the logic and distribution of power and systems of domination. Now, I'm very happy to turn to Asha Ashokan of nuclearban.us to tell us more about the work of the TPNW. Asha. Thank you, Sophia. Um, let me just screen share. <clears throat> I hope you all can see um, how and why the nuclear weapon is, uh, is, a, is a threat to the human existence. Um, I had the opportunity, or unfortunately, I, I worked in uh, South Sudan, a country which was affected by armed conflict for many years. And I've seen the horrific impact of war on human, especially on civilians, uh, women and children. Uh, immediately after the humanitarian crisis or the armed conflict, we were able to respond to the um, humanitarian crisis either by providing water, either by providing uh, shelter, food, and medical services. But in the event of a human, uh, in the event of a nuclear uh, weapon or a war. Uh, will not be able to respond to this humanitarian crisis. And that's why the nuclear weapon is considered as, uh, as, a, as a, an existential threat. Um, I'm not going into the details of this one because the movie has all, we have already seen the movie and um, uh, Sophia and uh, Jory has already talked more about it. But I just wanted to point out like, um, if a nuclear war happens now, 
for example, B-83, which is the largest bomb in the current U.S. arsenal, or R-12, which is the largest uh, Soviet missile. If it is used, two million people will die from the blast and radioactive fires. Um, there will be soot in the atmosphere, drop in the Earth's uh, temperature, block sunlight, and a famine which will affect us, which will force uh, two billion people to starvation. Now, nine nuclear weapon countries, um, there are nine countries that have nuclear weapons. Um, 13, more than 13,000 nuclear weapons are with this nine, nine nuclear weapon countries. Um, 186 nuclear weapon, there are countries which doesn't have nuclear weapons. Um, looking into the TPNW, this reminds me of this particular uh, wordings. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has happened. Few non-nuclear weapon states and a coalition of civil society organizations. Um, uh, during, as a result of three conferences, resulted in the formation in the creation of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapon. So in July 2017, the treaty was adopted. And in uh, September 2017, uh, it was open for a signature. And in January 2021, it came into force. Now the TPNW, if you look, there is 20, only 22 Point eight percentage is not support is not supporting the TPNW, and only eight point six percentage is undecided about whether to support or not to support the TPNW. But otherwise, all around the world, the majority of the countries um, support TPNW. What does the TPNW means, or how is it different from the NPT or the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty? So the Article 1 of the TPNW states that each state party takes, undertakes never under any circumstance, develop nuclear weapons, test nuclear weapons, produce nuclear weapons, acquire nuclear weapons, stockpile nuclear weapons, transfer nuclear weapon, use or threaten to use nuclear weapon, host nuclear weapon, or assist with, encourage these activities. In addition to that one, what makes uh, TPNW different from the NPT or the Nuclear Pro Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty is that it also has a victim assistance clause, which says that each state party shall, with respect to the individuals under its jurisdiction, if it is affected by uh, the testing of nuclear weapon, will have to provide victim assistance. And it also talks about the international cooperation and assistance between the nations for eliminating, for implementation of this treaty and for the elimination of uh, nuclear weapon. Now nuclear weapon, uh, the nine nuclear weapon states, uh, the countries have not signed the TPNW. And what effect can we expect the treaty to have on them? Um, when if, for example, if another country is uh, signing or ratifying the TPNW, uh, then US, if you, if US have many of its stockpiles in, an, in a stationed in uh, stationed outside of the US, which means that the states with another new nation's nuclear weapon stationed in on their territory must remove them, which means that if it is in another country, for example, in US um, nuclear weapon is in another country in Canada and Canada signs the treaty. That means these weapons will have to be removed from Canada. While any treaty is technically only binding on the states that join it, the TPNW establishes a new international legal standard against which all nuclear policies will now be judged. And in addition to that one, many of the countries, many of the companies are divesting from a uh, nuclear weapon. For example, a growing number of banks, pension funds, and insurance companies around the world are now divesting from companies that build nuclear weapon. This includes the Norwegian Pension Fund, um, Belgium's largest bank, KBC, uh, Resins hold, Holdings, um, and many other uh, many other companies and fun pension funds are being, you know, like divesting from the nuclear weapon. Um, mm -hmm. 
One of the arguments the US and the other major uh, nuclear weapon countries have been making is that it undermines, undermines the NPT. Um, it doesn't, it does not undermine the NPT. If you look into the article six of the NPT or the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, uh, before going into that one, the NPT is only for states without, uh, NPT is, is preventing the proliferation of nuclear weapons, which means states without nuclear weapons will not acquire them, and states with nuclear weapons will pursue disarmament, and all states can access nuclear technology for peaceful purpose, purpose and the safeguards. Um, as I said earlier, one of the arguments the, the nuclear weapon countries have been making is that it undermines the NPT. But if you look into the Article 6 and the preamble of the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty, it clearly says that uh, there will be a complete disarmament and there's a strict and effective international control. So it is not um, in, in, in competition with the NPT, but it is, it is in tune with the NPT. But it includes the other, uh, other uh, nuclear uh, weapon, countries that have nuclear weapon, which is not a party to the NPT. And the other argument is that it is for the global security and for uh, it will be used only for deterrence. In that case, if nuclear weapons are a deterrent, why, if, and if all the other uh, nations are saying that we also wanted that security, and if they also start building the nuclear weapon, where are we going to end? So in 1945, we only had one nuclear weapon. Uh, the only US had the nuclear weapons. Now there are nine nuclear weapon countries. Looking into the, um, the nuclear weapon, the, the argument, even though the uh, nuclear weapon countries have been making the argument that it's for deterrence, but hiddenly it is a business. It is a huge business where a lot of money is being spent on the nuclear weapon. For example, last year in 2020, when we were all going through the, uh, the pandemic, the, new, the, uh, the nine nuclear weapon countries invested $72.6 billion uh, for nuclear weapon. And if you look into the, the, the cycle, how it was going, how much money is being used for lobbying, how much money is spent on, uh, how much money is given to the think tanks, um, that's all very clear. So 72 billion has been spent on nuclear weapons um, last year in 2020. And the United States spent 37 for 37.4 uh, billion. Um, and the, all the other, the, the information related to the other countries is also here. And now the US is now planning to spend 1.7 trillion over the next 30 years on new nuclear weapon developments alone. Um, that is in addition to 900 billion for the ongoing cost of the weapons for 30 years. That is equivalent to 2.6 trillion plus. As I told, like so 72 billion has been spent last year. Now, who is benefiting from this nuclear weapon uh, budget? Or these are the companies, or these are the institution, financial institutions that has been benefiting from the nuclear weapon. Companies like Honeywell, companies like um, Boeing, all those companies have been benefiting from the nuclear weapon. If you look into the, uh, the TPNW, uh, Article 1, it says it prohibited to assist, encourage, or induce in any way anyone to engage in any activity prohibited to a state party under this treaty, which means working for these companies are prohibited, supplying to these companies are prohibited, buying from these companies, loan to these companies, have shares in these companies, are going, are, are going to affect. That's why even if the U.S. is not going even if the US is delaying its signature, if the other countries are going to sign and ratify the TPNW, it's definitely going to affect, uh, affect the economy um, because of this and this reasons. Now, what are we doing at different levels um, to get the, TP, get the US to sign and ratify the TPNW? When I say sign, it, uh, you know, signing is not a new thing because the US has already committed uh, by signing the NPT. So it's a recommitment if they are really serious about eliminating nuclear weapon. Uh, that's very important if they're really serious about eliminating the nuclear weapon. So there are at all levels, we have been trying to um, 
get support for the TPNW. At the federal level, uh, there is a bill called 2850, which is introduced by um, Representative Elena Holmes Norton, which is calling the US to sign and ratify the TPNW and take leadership in eliminating nuclear weapons. At the state levels, for example, in Massachusetts, um, very recently, uh, two bills were introduced, or there was a hearing for two bills was conducted by the uh, the committee, um, the Nuclear Weapon Commission Bill and the Back from the Brink Resolution Bill, and the committee held a meet, uh, held a hearing on these two bills um, to make a decision on uh, to to move to the other to move it to the. Uh, the, the next process of the legislation if they if they decided to do that um, at the municipal level at the uh, at the uh, town and uh, at the town and may town level there has been um, resolutions and ordinances uh, preventing investing in nuclear we nuclear uh, weapon has been done and uh, Northampton is one of the one of the examples for that So what can you do um, to build support for the TPNW? First one is asking your representatives to sign an ICANN pledge. Um, I will send you all these details, which is in our website. Um, so you, I, you can ask your representative to sign the ICANN pledge, uh, which is an international commitment to support the TPNW. At the moment, there are 11 uh, members of the Congress who have signed the ICANN pledge. And the second is asking your representative to support the Norton's bill by co-sponsoring the bill. Um, at the moment, there are six members of the Congress who have uh, who's co-sponsoring the bill. Uh, this Norton's bill is at the federal level. And at the state level, I'm just giving you the uh, Massachusetts one, but in other states there are initiate there are initiatives. But in the Massachusetts level, there is there are two uh, important bills, which is. Senate Bill 1555 and Senate Bill 1556, um, which you can ask your member uh, representative to co-sponsor uh, these bills. In addition to that one, we are also submitting a letter to the committee endorsing uh, the organizations can endorse this letter where we are asking the committee to take this uh, two bills seriously and move it to the next process of the legislation. And divesting from nuclear weapon that anybody can do, individuals, institutions can do that um, by making sure that you know you are socially investing in a socially responsible way, because there are many banks which is investing in nuclear weapons. I didn't know that Bank of America was uh, America is investing in nuclear weapon. There has been reports related to that, and citizens speaking up and cities are calling on their governments to support and join the treaty. Now, as a global citizen, what action can you do to eliminate existential threat of nuclear weapon, um, nuclear weapon and nuclear war? And I, this will be discussed in detail in the next breakout session. Um, I don't know whether we still have time for one video. Uh, Sophia, do you think we still have time for one more? Not really. Okay. Um, it's just oh, two minutes. We'll just play it, just do it. Okay. I'm Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Thank you all so much, especially the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, ICANN, and their nuclear ban, the U.S., for inviting me. It is my honor to be with all of you and speak in support of the ICANN pledge and the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. As a mother of two, I dream of a world where my boys can lead lives free from the threat and fear of nuclear war. Nuclear weapons are simply too dangerous for any nation to possess, and could be devastating for our planet. And we saw that in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's truly a testament to the fact that we have to move with a sense of urgency. In addition to the threat they pose to humanity, the development, production, and maintenance of nuclear weapons is extremely expensive and unnecessary, especially when there are so many people in need across the globe. Over the next decade, estimates say that we will nearly spend in the United States half a trillion dollars on nuclear weapons. That's a half a trillion dollars that could be invested in providing health care, clean water, quality education to every single neighbor across our country. The consequences of our nation's obsession with military power and spending are on full display 
in districts like mine where we have water that's undrinkable and unaffordable, crumbling schools and a broken healthcare system. I can go on and on. That is why I call for divesting from war and violence and instead investing in healthcare, our environment, our communities, and our people. I am proud to support ICANN Pledge and the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and urge my colleagues to please do the same. Thank you again for the invitation and thank you so much for your courageous work. I really appreciate it. And please know that you always have a partner in the United States Congress with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asha. So we are moving right along. I want to harp on your presentation, but we'll not. So um, Kathy, could you introduce the next breakout? It will be um, a couple, a few minutes shorter um, to try and keep as close to time as possible. Um, and I will be putting a link in the chat right now. So everybody please open it while Kathy is speaking to prepare for the breakout. Kathy? Okay, in your second breakout groups, you can participate in one of two activities or both. Specifically, you can continue your engaged discussion from breakout one, trying to include ideas about actions you can take going forward from tonight, or you can review the action handout for a minute or so, maybe, and then um, share with the group for about a minute what actions you would like to take from the taking action suggestions on that handout, which Sophia is posting. Hello and welcome back. Um, and thank you again for participating in these breakouts. I know um, they can be exciting for some and overwhelming for others. So thank you, thank you. And we hope that they were rich. Um, time for sharing. Before we close, I do invite um, anyone who has actions to share, put them in the chat. We will do our best to put those up on the actions handout and we'll be following up with an email to all the participants in the next day or two. Um, we hope that this supports your engagement in whatever way you feel led moving forward. Um, please do include links and titles. Um, we encourage you to attend more of the programs. There are so many for Hiroshima and Nagasaki week, even just here in Massachusetts, although I know that folks are coming from all over the continent and the world. Um, and so uh, Mass Peace Actions website is listed um, on that actions handout, Cole, please do put it in the chat if you're able to, um, if folks wanna see other ways um, to attend. Please stay tuned for the next two uh, parts of this uh, introductory sort of series on the TPNW that we're putting on. Um, and if you want to be involved in our work and or organizing group, please uh, do follow up on that follow-up email. Um, thank you again for all of the organizers, for the support, for the contributions and for your participation. Um, and uh, please do stay safe. Uh, please do stay connected as possible. Um, and now turning to Sarah, um, as we close out the program, um, thank you, thank you, thank you, and peace. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, well, um, because we talked about music when we were doing some of the organizing for this event, and um, it seemed so important to have music. And I said, well, of course, we have to sing Imagine, which is the greatest hymn in many ways to our whole movement. And I've been working with the words of that song um, since I started in the 80, 50 years ago, working on nuclear disarmament and then getting as many women as possible involved in being anti-nuclear people. And now today, I think that we can say um, women have not only made it into all the different sections of disarmament, but have a powerful role to play. What I wanted to say about Imagine as a song, um, it was a revolutionary song. A lot of people didn't like it. It was much too strong. And it's wonderful. 
author said, you know, we're working class people, working class people. And that's what this song represents. But the second thing that he said that was so important for us was that you could really see a world without war <laughs> and that you could see war as, as a gross distortion. <clears throat> Nothing to kill or die for. Don't ever forget those words. So we're going to sing this song or hear it sung. And Nothing to, to, to live or die for, nothing to um, kill or die for. Um, that's why it was so revolutionary. It challenges everything that we're taught to believe as we grow up. And I think the work that you're all doing today and describing is something that would make him extremely proud that he wrote that song and that he actually was in the process of making his wife the, the half owner of the song because Yoko Ono had done so much to make that song come to life. And so um, he was working for women as well as the world. And so let's hear the song. <laughs> I don't really need to say anything, but okay. Um, Thank you all. I'm not sure, Stair just got muted, so I'm not sure, but this is the close of our program. We are six minutes past. I appreciate everybody who has stayed on. Um, thank you, thank you, and please do um, spread peace, spread love, spread joy, and do stay safe. Thank you.